I'm reaching out to young men, not just because of the dancing possibilities. Dance it has to be my expertise, but I want them to become better people. That's dancer, choreographer, and teacher, Earl Mosley. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Earl Mosley is a dynamo. He came to dancing late, but he came with talent and conviction. He forged a stage career with Ailey Two, Gus Solomon's Dance, and Ron Brown's Evidence Dance. He's choreographed for many companies, including Alvin Ailey, Ailey Two, and Dallas Black Theater. But it was during Mosley's performing career that he discovered his passion for teaching. Aside from being on the faculty for the Ailey School, and Montclair State College. He's also the founder and creative director of Diversity of Dance, which is the parent organization of the Earl Mosley Institute of the Arts, or EMEA. EMEA gives student artists from diverse ethnic, cultural, and socioeconomic backgrounds the support and space they need to develop, not just their talent, but their characters. The emphasis is always on discipline, respect, and positive collaborations with teachers and peers. EMEA offers a number of programs, including two summer residential intensives in Kent, Connecticut, countrywide teaching workshops and residencies, and dance education for schools in underserved communities. Earl Mosley's most ambitious project, however, is probably the Hearts of Men. The Hearts of Men is an outreach program that began five years ago. It celebrates men through dance. It brings students together for a two-week intensive. That is classes and rehearsals all day, every day, learning all styles of dance, ballet, hip-hop, tap, modern, free expression, and so on. Choreographers work with the students and set dances on them. And then at the end of two weeks, the students give a performance. This is uncommon enough, but Earl Mosley's particular philosophy of dance and education makes the hearts of men a true rarity. I spoke with Earl Mosley during the Hearts of Men intensive at Montclair State College. And here's a heads up. You'll hear a slight change in the audio when we had to switch rooms because of construction noise. Now let's describe what happens with Hearts of Men. First of all, who are the people who come here? We have all demographics. We have a young man now who's 13, and the oldest person participating is 66. So the ages vary. People, some people never dance a day in their life. So there are no auditions? No, no, there is no audition process. There's just registration, because you, know, you want to know who's actually going to attend, you know, all those things, but there's no audition process. It's, it's non-competitive. There are very diverse and varied styles that they, they were approaching. All that. different body types. All different body types, um, experiences, technical levels. What was the idea behind it? When Dudley Williams was alive, former Ailey superstar Dudley Williams, who helped me actually originate the program, because I went to him about this idea, and he was like, Earl, you know, in all of my life, and I've been dancing, you know, longer than you've been alive, I've never had a platform where it was just men dancing. And that's a whole other conversation, you know, wh- why men dancing? One, the phobias, you know. How do you help them to have the confidence to say, I'm a dancer? I've been in those shoes where I felt like, you know, you want to kind of mumble it, I'm a dancer. People are like, what did you say? What did you say? You're a dancer. Are you gay? Like, what does that mean? What does that mean? When actually I learned, it just means I'm a dancer. No attachments, like you're a doctor. Nobody says anything about if you want to be a doctor, you're just a doctor. I'm just a dancer. And the young men, when they leave, always feel a thousand times more confident about saying, I'm a dancer. How many people are in the program this this session? This session, we have, I would say, roughly like between 53 and 55. And they're not all dancers. No, no, they're not all dancers. We have a young man here named Stefan, Stefan Glasgow. He's a musician. The other day I was speaking with him, and I said, why dance? Why, why, why here? He said, you know, I play the violin, I play piano, and I do percussion. He said, but this is an interesting note. He said, especially when I'm playing classical music, I want to dance. He said, but I never told anybody. I'm telling you now. He said, I never told anybody. What are you aiming for in the hearts of men? What are you going for? I'm reaching out to young men, not just because of the dancing possibilities. Dance has to be my expertise. 
but I want them to become better people. But I'm using what I know, which helped me, which helped save my life, which is dancing. And I always say, you know, if you touch a young boy's heart, you can save his life. I'm trying to teach him to be respectful to others who don't look like him. I'm trying to teach him to know that just because you're from somewhere, that doesn't mean that that's, that's who you are. I let these young men know that through what I have learned, which is dance. And I think it's a beautiful communicator. I think you don't have to speak. I think people feel your aura, they feel your spirit, they feel your passion, they feel you, I think, at your most honest point when you're really committed to it. What do you think bringing all these people in with uh, such a diversity of experience and age gets at? It's like it, it, it opens up everyone to uh, allow themselves to be a better version of themselves. You know, how's your spirit? What's your heart doing? Let's take it from there and let's see how we treat each other in the studio. Let's see how we treat each other outside of the studio. Let's see if somebody as, as prominent as Matthew Rushing can dance with a fifth grade boy with no training. That's beautiful. And then to see that fifth grade boy have a, such a level of intent and commitment that's equal to Matthew Rushing's. So you just see two dancers at that moment. You don't see this thing of like, oh, well, surely he's a professional and surely he's a little novice. No, you see two people out there expressing their love at that one moment, whether it's to each other or the world. At that one moment, they may not ever have it again, but they had that one moment that, that would last them a lifetime. Well, it's interesting also because you think about getting a group of men together. And a lot of the men you have are men of color, though not exclusively, clearly. Right. And you think about other opportunities where that happens. And there's sports. Oh, yes. And there's sports. Oh, <laughs> my God. But to do it around something like mm -hmm. dance. Mm -hmm. But then you have this intergenerational relationships going mm -hmm. on at the same time. Yeah. Again, you have Steve Haley, Stephen Haley, who's here. He's 13. And again, you have Graham here, who's 66. And then you have someone as prominent dancer as Clifton Brown, who's 36. Those are three different generations there and different bodies. And they're all looking at each other. And then they say, you know, all those bodies are dancing together. Non-judgmental. If anything, inspired. Inspired. The common denominator was that they were there right now sharing in this special moment of men not fighting, men not having to feel like they got to be macho, men not feeling like they have to brag about how many trophies they have on their trophy case, if you know what I mean. Men not chasing a ball. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and knowing that this is just important, if not more. This is just as beautiful, if not more. Well, it's, it's a side of men that they don't get to explore. Yeah, yeah, But it yeah. doesn't mean it's not there. That doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, and it should, it, should, it should be applauded because, as I say, how many dancers do you hear of out here doing mass murders? How many dancers do you hear of out here robbing banks? How many dancers do you hear? How many artists do you hear? Let's forget dance. How many artists do you hear doing those things? No one's perfect, but statistically speaking, it's going to be like apples and oranges. And I mean like a, a whole lot of oranges and a little less apples. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I was like, why not? People, everyone's trying their way. Why not try it in this way? Okay, let's do some backtracking here. I want to know more about you. Where were you born? Where were you raised? What was your childhood like? Ah, interesting topic of discussion. I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. Grew up on a pig farm. You didn't see that one coming. Grew up on a pig farm. We also had like, you know, the vegetable gardens and and greens of all sorts and tomatoes, all, all of those things. And had no concept of dancing or didn't even think about it because I would, in the summer, we spent most of our summers out plying the fields and picking the watermelons or if it wasn't that, then my dad had us attending to pigs and cows and all kinds of things. So I basically grew up on a farm. And seven brothers and two sisters, a large family. Where were you in it? Second to the youngest. So you grew up basically working on the family farm after school. Right, right. You know, I hate to use the word typical, but maybe I will. Household of everybody's working hard. My father, he would always say, I'm not going to have any lazy children. So we would get angry because, you know, when you're, you, when you're young and school's out for the summer, you're like, 
it's the summertime, let's go swimming, let's go to the ponds. So while our friends and cousins were out playing games, my father had us out there planting seeds for this vegetable or that vegetable or cutting the grass. And if not our grass, the neighbor's grass. Like he always made sure he had us doing something. And then maybe on that Saturday or that Friday, that was your time. But Monday through Thursday, consistently, from that time, you know, whenever school lets off, like mid-June or so, till leading up to that returning, he made sure we were doing something. And sometimes me and my brothers, my sisters, we're all like, oh, can't we be in that other family? You, you're looking at them thinking, man, they're having fun. They're going to the movies. They're going to the park. They're going swimming. And here we are out here in this blazing hot sun. But as I got older, I realized I was getting up in the morning on my own. I realized that I was one of those kids that had a part-time job. So you didn't, you didn't see those lessons he was, trying, he was trying to instill at a younger age because I guess you're just too immature, too naive to understand the bigger picture. I would also think it was an early lesson in, look, we work as a family. Ah, community. Right, yeah. right, right, right. We work as a family. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to contribute. Everybody's going to give their share. Everybody's going to earn their keep because the dinners that we, we were fortunate to eat literally were the ones that we had to pick, whether, whether it was the poultry or the pork or what, whatever. More than half of it, I would say, was self-produced. And some of it was ugly, but we were never hungry. And it did instill a, a sense of like family meaning taking care of each other also. That type of bonding, I think, helped me to be the person that I am, wanting to, to reach out to so many younger people to help them to stay guided and, and to stay focused. Well, how did, how did you and dance discover one another? Well, I was told that I was always dancing. My mom even would t- told me, you know, she said, when you were younger, we always noticed you were always dancing, but we just thought you were just a kid listening to the latest songs on the radio like all the other kids were. But Earl, you would always be the one, though. You could catch on to those dances that you didn't know the fastest, and then you end up teaching them to other people, and you would always practice them so much. So people would say to me, oh, that kid's a dancer, that kid's a dancer. But I still thought that meant that kid was a dancer socially. Did you even know somebody could dance profession? I mean, no, yeah. no, 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 had no, had no idea, had, yeah. had, had no idea. You know, it was a typical, again, blue collar family, everybody's working to make a living. And anything that was professional was what we saw on the TV. And that meant, oh, that's something that's so far away from what we could probably achieve. So I'm appreciating it watching Michael Jackson, watching Liza Minnelli or Barishnikov or whomever it may be, wow, they're really great, but they're out there in the universe somewhere else. I don't really know where they are. Tell me how and when you got to your first dance class. At the end of my 11th grade year, one of my best friends at the time, Maria Taylor, she said, you know what, Earl, I want you to take a dance class. I dare you. I know of this class. You're going to go take it. It wasn't a technical class. It was a creative movement class. And it was happening in my high school. I just didn't know about it. And I showed up. No dance belt, no tights, none of that stuff. I didn't know that stuff even existed. But had my warm-ups on. Teacher's name Miss Arnold. I'll never forget her. She let me take the class. And I had a great time. And I kept coming back. Now, we fast forward. I'm in, like I would say, the fall of my senior year of high school. President of the student council, all this stuff very involved in school, making decent grades. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to become an accountant. An accountant. Right. I'm going to become an accountant. And next thing I know, my friend and I, Maria, we're talking. She said, I'm auditioning for this school called North Carolina School of the Arts, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She wanted to be a dancer. Next thing I know, I go to my guidance counselor at school. I fill out an application. I said, I think I want to try it. What did your parents say? Yeah, they were like, what? They looked at me like I was crazy. They didn't say no, though. They were just like, what, where is this coming from? And I said, I think I, wanna, I might want to be a dancer. I just want to see because people keep saying it. So maybe I should just, just try it. And they were like, all right, fine, go ahead, go ahead. But I don't know how you're getting there. Go ahead. Fortunate enough, you always have that cousin or that aunt or somebody that's like, don't worry, I got you. So my cousin Gwen, I talked to her about it. She's one of those ones that I can rely on. She said, I'll drive you. So she drove both Maria and I to the audition. And... No prior training, I kid you not, no prior training. I went in there with this, the warm-ups on. I had a Mickey Mouse T-shirt on and went in there, and the audition was a ballet and Graham. I didn't know who Martha Graham was. I didn't know what fifth position. I didn't know. 
But what I did know, I had a feeling that I could actually dance. And I thought, if you could dance, then you could dance. And this, and, and I was so naive, I was uneducated to know what the physics of putting technique together was. I thought I could look at something and copy it. That was what I've been doing all of my life. So I uh, went to the audition and I followed because I certainly didn't know the vocabulary. So long story short, they didn't cut me at the audition. I was like, okay, I'm still here. And now it's time for the solos. I choreographed my own solo in the audition. I totally forgot all of the movement because I was so nervous. And I improv at least two thirds of the solo. That's you know over 30 years ago now. But I think I just basically went crazy up in there. And I think they knew too, because at the end of it, I, I kid you not, at the end of the solo, I did a typical sliding on my knees and went, ta-da. <laughs> I did. I went, ta-da. <laughs> well, I know for a fact. I can see their faces as I'm, as I'm saying this. They just stared at me, no expression in their faces, and then they stared at each other. They said, thank you for coming. And that was it. I was like, oh, my God. They didn't say if I was accepted or not. I don't know anything. So I was nervous. I couldn't sleep. Less than two days later, I got a letter of acceptance. And so did my friend Maria. Oh, my God. Talk about a life-changing moment. Oh, my God. When that happened, I knew I really wanted to do it. And this was something that I never dreamt could have happened, especially growing up on the dirt road in Raleigh, North Carolina. I never dreamt it could have happened, and dance was something that acts like a different language or something. And so I was intrigued. I was excited. It was bringing me out of my comfort zone. It was a new world of possibilities. Oh, my God. And your parents were okay with this? Well, my parents didn't say no. They didn't say yes either. They gave me that thing of like, you decide. Fast forward some years, here I am, I'm in school, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I get that phone call, unfortunately, from my dad. Finally, they voiced their opinion. We thought you were going to be an accountant. We, we thought you were going to do this. We thought you were going to do da 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 By then, I'd made friends who, were, who had been doing it for much longer and told me about Martha Graham, told me about Alvin Ailey, Merce Cunningham, Paul Taylor, all these people that I have no idea of. And I was like, I want to move to New York because everybody's moving to New York. That's where you go, New York, New York, New York. And then I, I bombshell, I want to move to New York also. What? Are you crazy? You're going to end up on crack. You're going to, you're going to end up on the streets. Oh, I thought you were the sane one in the family. We had such high hopes for you. My father literally said to me, if you don't move back home, don't ever talk to us again. That's it. I'm done with this. Hung up the phone. Wow. What did you do? You know what I did? I had made enough friends through NCSA because he knows that's you know top ranked school, so students come there from all around the world. I made friends that a lot of them were from New York. They knew my situation, and some of them were like, "Well, you guess what? You can stay with my uncle here, or you can do this there. There's that place called the Alvin Ailey American Dance Center. You should go study there." Like they offered me so many suggestions, and again, I wasn't one to sit around, and I wasn't one to let what my father said turned me away because he's the one that taught me when someone tells you you can't do something, do it. So I was applying the lessons that he taught me and it actually I guess it worked against him in that case because I didn't buckle up. I was like, no, I want to do this. That's what I'm going to do. So you got to New York. What did you do when you got there? Got on scholarship at the Ailey School, which then was the Alvin Ailey American Dance Center. Got on scholarship there and I'm summing up a lot of, a yeah, lot, yeah, a lot yeah. of things. Within three weeks of doing that, next thing I know, Sylvia Waters, who was the director at the time, is like, Earl, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm fine. And Sylvia Waters is director of Ailey 2. Yes. I didn't even know the lady even knew my name. I'm fine. Two days later, she was like, I want you to be in the company. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, holy crap. And I was floored, you know. She was like, go downstairs and rehearse. I need a dancer. Go downstairs and rehearse. And that set the tone of what would come years, years later. I met Denise Jefferson. And Denise Jefferson was director of the Ailey School. Right. And her and Sylvia Waters gave me a platform where I could say, okay, you're getting paid to do what you love to do so you can, you can continue to, to evolve and grow. Do you see that time in New York as foundational in some ways? Yeah. Coming to New York was a, a huge you know, moment in my life. Seeing the Ailey Company, getting into their junior company, developing all those relationships with the male dancers in the company, such as Carl Bailey, Gary DeLoach. Those men, they would see the younger dancers and 
walk over to us and how are you doing today? Or you have lunch money? Or are you, are you going to class? Any concerns? Milton Myers was such a great teacher of mine. He, he made sure my technique stayed in, stayed, stayed together and I was disciplined and I, I went to class. He opened his, literally his, his home to me. You know, those types of things really had an impact on me being able to, you know, endure those times of the lows, the low moments where you could have easily have been discouraged to say, okay, you know what, maybe my dad was right. Maybe I should just go back to North Carolina and be that accountant that they all think I should be. Yeah, it's a tough business. Yeah, 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 no no guarantees, you know. So those moments helped, helped to sustain me and sustain my desire to still dream about it, being this, this dancer, this performing artist, the, the hope that still felt like it was possible. And then um, along with those things happening, again, Denise Jefferson and Sylvia Waters and people like like those um, ladies were the ones saying, okay, now here's another, here's a little opportunity, like a little nugget. Teach the teenagers, teach the kids. Because I think they, they saw something there and they were like, I think you might be good at this, so we want to give you opportunities. And that's what started the teaching part of my, of my life. But I had no idea about choreography. I never thought I would be in that seat of saying, okay, now I'm going to create the dance. Never, was never interested. How did that change? How did you get into choreography? One day, Denise Jefferson, Denise Jefferson looked at me and said, I'm starting a new program here at the school called the Junior Division. It's a program for teenagers, and I want you to do their workshop. I want you to choreograph on them. And my face was like, try to play it off, but I was terrified. You want me to choreograph on them? She said, yes, I want you to choreograph on them. And, you know, and they were, they were so, <laughs> like, mamas and authoritative and confident in the way they said anything to you. The only reply was, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward now, the teaching escalated. They, they trusted me. They always left a good impression, even if I messed up. I did mess up a lot. I made a lot of mistakes. They read me. Don't get me wrong. They let me have it. And I think it's what helped them to trust me even more because they they saw that I was really trying to learn from them disciplining me as well as them saying, okay, now go out and make up a dance. And you began diversity of dance pretty early on in your career. Yes. It was a professional dance and and teaching company. Right. What was your thoughts about it? What, What was your goal? To take all these life lessons and share them with colleagues at the time who had mutual philosophies and beliefs about diversity, about how we're all created different. We all come from different life experiences. And that's a really beautiful thing. And don't front about it. Really, really try our best to express it. It's okay if we don't have that same look, whatever that look is. You know, there's always, in dance, there's always an aesthetic. There's always a look. It's okay that we actually do look different. It's okay that we're not all ballet dancers. or Well, not all modern dancers. But do we have a, a synergy? Do we have a spirit that brings us together? I think that makes it beautiful. Me and my colleagues at the time, my friends, we all felt that. And so we all said, wow, I love dancing with you. So why don't we just do it? It was really that simple. Why don't we just do it? And moving forward from that, next thing I know, we were putting on small concerts in in New York City and got a lot of positive feedback. And Diversity of Dance gives birth to the Earl Mosley Institute of the Arts, or EMEA. Right, right. Which has a real focus on teaching. What's the backstory there? Well... Who's knocking on my door again is Sylvia Waters. And she's like, well, I have this project that that I have happening in in Connecticut, and we're working with seventh graders, and I want you to come teach and set a small piece on them. And again, yes, ma'am. It was called Project Poetry Live. And there was a lady named Vita Muir, who was a saint. She was the one that contracted Sylvia. She loved the way I worked with the middle school age group. She loved the way I worked. And she said, I think that you are really a teacher, and I can tell you love young people. I took that conversation back to my friends that were dancing with me. I said, guys, what if we take our dancing part of us and really implement that into teaching as well, not just dancing? Because we all love kids, so why don't we reach out? Hands down, unanimous, everybody agreed. And that's how the Earl Mosley Institute of the Arts was born. Yeah, that, that's, how, that's how it began. You know, aside, aside from Hearts of Men, EMEA does dance education of all kinds for mostly underserved kids. And it does residencies and workshops for teachers. It has residential summer intensives in Connecticut. And recently you developed a program 
which you call Art Express, where you work with three schools and their dance students are eligible for your summer intensive, but then you send an artist in residence and teaching assistants to those schools during the year. Right. To work with the kids. So there's a continuity. Right, right. Well, the thing is, in all, in all honesty, people have said it, and I wish this as well. I wish EMEA could be a year-round experience. How do you keep that educational component of dance going? Thanks to the NEA and allowing us to continue for 11 summers now, going on our 12th summer, we are able to have collaborations with these different institutions like Education Arts Center in New Haven, Brooklyn High School of the Arts, and Boston Arts Academy. We predominantly work with those three. Our teachers going to Boston to be with them for a week or two, or going to Brooklyn for a week or two to actually teach and set rep and just continue what, what has started in those four weeks of being in Kent, Connecticut, just to keep that going. So it's a huge plus, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And in closing, I think we need to circle back to Hearts of Men because there's a performance this weekend. All the guys here for the Hearts of Men Intensive, they're taking classes every day where they're rehearsing every day. They're doing this for two weeks, and then they put on a performance. And what a show it is. It's, 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 it's fascinating. I had no idea the reactions would be as huge as they are. We started the idea in 2011. The culminating performances happened in the Ailey Studios, 55th Street. The audience, again, the impact, oh my God, people were crying. Oh my God, all these guys, like 15, 16 guys. Oh my God, they're dancing. They're not, they're not just lifting, they're dancing. They're, oh my God, they're really dancing. We don't see this too often. Intergenerational, we don't see that too often. The diversity of it, we don't see that too often. This is great, do it again. And now here we are in 2016, doing it as an intensive, the third intensive. The first intensive was 2014 here at Montclair. Culminating performances were sold out. Um, they have a thousand seat theater here at the Presidium Stage and Memorial Auditorium. It was sold out. I was overwhelmed, and that doesn't happen too often. After the performance, it was like a, it was like a rock concert. After they performed, I kid you not, the audience went crazy. People stayed here after the performance. I'm not making this up. You can ask Dean Gerkes himself. After the performance, he was one of them. People stayed here, I would say, easily close to two hours in the lobby, still just talking, nice. just celebrating. 2015, we did it at the Ailey School. We had 84 performers. 84. The same reaction. It was fantastic. I think there we can leave it. I really want to thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. That's dancer, choreographer, and teacher, Earl Mosley. The Hearts of Men will be performed September 10th and 11th at Montclair State College. For more information, go to emiadance.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>